Hi. <laughs> that works. Wait, did I mention the flying? I'm, I'm sure I did, but I'm mentioning it again because it's awesome. All on this episode of Science Max, Experiments at Large. Okay, Science Maximites, prepare to heart go through the cosmos. I am Captain Phil, and today we're going to be building rockets on Science Max. Now, we've, we've built rockets before, like this one, powered by air pressure. And this one, stomp rockets, which were also technically powered by air pressure. Air pressure rocket! But today, Science Maximites, we are going to be building rockets powered by chemistry! Chemical-powered rockets! Away! Mm. Okay, I promise it'll be more exciting than that. Because today, Science Maximites, we are going to be looking at chemistry. Chemistry is when two molecules combine to make another molecule. Like magic, ooh. So let's take a look at what will be powering our chemical rocket. This, it's an antacid tablet. When you put an antacid tablet in water, it makes little bubbles of carbon dioxide gas. This happens because of a reaction between two kinds of molecules called acids and bases. Like vinegar and baking soda, but all contained in a small package that won't start working until you put it in water. If we contain the reaction, the carbon dioxide gas builds up and creates pressure. High five for science. All right, so let's look at our chemical-powered rocket. What you need is one of these. This is a... This is a film canister. And ask your parents what that actually means because they're not used for holding film anymore. You can get these at craft stores, though, to hold paint or little things. But really, all you need is a plastic container with a good lid that snaps on nice and tight and keeps the air in. And then, of course, what you need are your antacid tablets and a little bit of water. So pour in some water and then put in your antacid tablet and snap the lid on. Flip it over and wait for the carbon dioxide gas to build up, which will build up pressure, which will... Launch your rocket! Ha-ha! <laughs> so there you go, a chemical-powered rocket. Come on, let's max it out. So first, I need an expert to help me. Um, let's, oh, Lisa from Logics Academy, of course! Logics Academy people have helped me launch all the rockets on Science Max. This is gonna be great. Uh, oh, I'm gonna get my helmet first. Okay, let's launch. Let's launch some rockets. Let's go. Whoa! Wow, it's really dark in this room. I can't see anything. Bill. Lisa. Bill. Lisa. Bill. Oh. 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 Where did this come from? Uh, I guess the portal's malfunctioning. Hey, Lisa! Hi! From Logics Academy, great to have you here. Great to be here. Let's put this over there. We are here to max out the chemistry rocket! Ooh, what is that? It's just a small plastic container. But when we put an antacid tablet in there and some water... Ah, we get a chemical reaction. We get a chemical reaction, and so that's what creates the pressure. And then that pops the lid off, and we get a little rocket. Kaboom! But now we're going to max it out. Get a bigger container Ooh, and more... Wait. What? How about if we launch a whole bunch of them? Ooh, so we just get a lot of the small one, mm -hmm. and we launch them all at the same time. Exactly. Okay, great. So we just need a whole bunch of these and yeah. a whole bunch of... And a whole bunch of science antacid. Yeah, well, that's okay. I get them both in bulk. Come on, <laughs> let's go, go put it together. And I'm a base, and we are enemies. <gasps> oh, well, we're not really enemies. Yeah, that's true. It's all about how we react chemically. You see, as an acid, I really want to give protons away. Protons, who needs your protons? Get your protons here. Protons, I got more than I want. I don't need them anymore. And bases, we need protons. We'll do anything to get them. Uh, protons, you can protons away. I'll take some, I'll take some protons. You think that when you get these two together, you'd have some pretty great chemistry. But the truth is, when they're together, they often don't react. Whoa. That is, until water gets involved. Once you have water, acids and bases react. Wow. 
Here, take some protons. All your base are belong to us. <laughs> there you go. Take some protons. I don't need more. I want more. Go. I want have more some of protons. Those. Here. Water is a solvent, allowing the chemical reactions to take place. <laughs> Depending on the strength of the acids and bases, that reaction can be mild. Would you like a proton? Oh, no, really. I could. Please, please take it. Oh, well, thank you. That's very generous. Have another. No, perhaps. Maybe I will. Here's yes, one. Okay, um, maybe just one. But if the acids and bases are strong, the chemical reaction can be really extreme. <laughs> this is what's going on in the antacid tablet. And why, without water, nothing happens. Oh, water! Water! Come on! What did you do? What? One. Lisa and I are maxing out our chemical-powered rocket not by making it bigger, but by making more of them. How many more? 400 caps all glued down, 400 antacid tablets, or part of, yep. all glued down, and they're glued on this fancy-pantsy spinning surface. Hmm. So we rotate this part upside down. We fill each container with a little water and snap it on underneath. This way, the antacid tablet and the water don't mix until we flip it back over. It also allows us time to snap them all on. Okay, ready? Ready. All right, 400 containers. Here we go. Let's do it. Once we flip the board back over, the reaction started taking place, building up carbon dioxide gas and increasing the pressure until... Oh. Whoa. Oh. on that. Yep. That worked spectacularly. That was awesome. So we've done this. Let's go bigger. Let's go bigger. bigger. Oh, okay. Definitely. So let's go and we'll clean right. this up afterwards. Yep, okay. Let's do it. Okay, let it go. Whoa. 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 This is a balloon and this is an orange. When you put them together, a chemical reaction happens. Ah, how'd you go in there for a minute, didn't I? It, no? No? All right. Well, you can actually do a chemical reaction between a balloon and an orange. You see, balloons are made of latex, which is a kind of polymer that's very, very stretchy. And orange peels contain a chemical called limonene. Limonene breaks down latex. <laughs> so, we have three questions. The first is, why does this happen? Well, like I said, it's all chemistry. You see, balloons are made of polymers, chains of molecules held together by chemical bonds. A limonene molecule attacks those bonds. Om nom nom nom, om nom nom, om nom nom nom, om nom nom, delicious. And breaks it, that separates the polymers, and that pops the balloon. But remember, it only works with natural latex. So make sure you're using natural latex balloons. Second question, why do they call it limonene when it's in orange peels? I mean, yes, it's in lime peels and lemon peels, but the chemical itself smells like oranges. They should call it orangenine or, or citrus frutinide or... Anyway, third question, should we max it out? Of course we should, come on. 200 balloons versus two bottles of limonene. Ready? Go!
attempt to max out our chemical rocket was 400 plastic containers. Oh, yeah. That worked well, but now it's time to make the container larger. Whoa! Giant maxed out chemistry rocket canister. I have a big plastic container with a groovy lid that sits there on airtight, which is great. And I have a giant jar of antacid. How many? It was like 60 antacid tablets or something? At least. This works exactly the same as our smaller containers. We dump the antacid in, seal the lid airtight, then flip it over. And now would be a good time to mention not to try this at home. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, it's not oh, gonna take God. long. So that was the canister version. Now we need the pop bottle version, the yes. rocket version. Yes. Okay, let's go make that. Let's do it. Okay. This is a light stick. It creates light using a chemical reaction. There's a liquid chemical inside and also a glass container that holds another chemical. When you bend the light stick, you break open the container and the two chemicals mix, creating light. There you go, light sticks, chemical reaction. And yes, of course, we're gonna max it out. This is a whole bunch of the two chemicals in a light stick. Let's max it out. So how does a chemical reaction produce light? Well, a lot of chemical reactions produce energy. You might think of a chemical reaction producing heat. Well, heat is a kind of energy. This chemical reaction also produces energy, just energy in the form of light. It's just a different kind of energy. Whoa, max out light stick! <laughs> and now for a Science Max quiz. Chemical change or not? What's a chemical change? Well, let's demonstrate. Look at this. It's a happy little molecule of iron. And here's another molecule of oxygen. If they were to have a chemical change, they would react and form different molecules. Look, it's a molecule of rust. Rust is a different chemical than either iron or oxygen. It's a chemical change. Now, if these molecules mixed and did not change, then it's not a chemical change, it's a physical change. Sometimes it's hard to tell if it's a chemical change just by looking, but asking what kind of change it is leads to good science. So let's look at some examples. Vinegar and baking soda. Is it a chemical change? Yes. Vinegar and baking soda react to form different chemicals. Sodium acetate, that's the white stuff that's left over, and carbon dioxide, which makes the bubbles. How about a nucleation fountain with diet cola and mints? Haha! -ha. A lot of people think that's a chemical change, but it's not. The mints cause carbonation, the bubbles, to escape faster. But in the end, you still have cola and mints, no new chemicals. And without the carbonation, nothing happens. So it's a physical change. Take a guess at this one, glow stick chemicals. Well, producing light or heat is usually a sign of a chemical change. How about mixing sugar and water to make a sugar pop? That's a physical change. You start with sugar and water, you mix them, and when you have a sugar pop, what chemicals are you left with? Well, sugar and water. So, no chemical change. It can be hard to tell sometimes, but whenever two things mix, think to yourself if it's a chemical change or a physical change. And now you know it's either one or the other. And that's the first step to good science. Thanks for playing our Science Max quiz. Our maxed out rocket worked great. <laughs> <laughs> now to make it look more like a rocket. So we have a mesh bag here to put the antacid in. Right. And we have um, some paper clips attached to it. And what are the paper clips for? Well, Phil, we have a magnet. Ah. And so the magnet sticks to the paper clip. And so that's what we have here. You see the bag is full of the antacid tablets, which we put through the mouth of the bottle and the magnet is holding the paper clips on the other side of the plastic so we can sort of move it along. So we can start with the bag over here where the water's down there, but now we attach the launcher like so. All this effort is to keep the reaction from happening until the bottle's on the launcher and we're ready to go. And then as we pull the bottle over, we bring the bag up this side 
And there, the water and the antacid have never touched. No reaction. All you need to do now is just, we pull this magnet away and the bag will fall into the water. And then we will have the launcher down here. And we pull the release and the rocket will go. We add some weight to the launcher to help keep it in place. Okay, right, wait, glass in. Safety first. Okay, ready? And then we pull the string with the magnet that drops the bag of antacid tablets in the water and starts the chemical reaction. Because we have a latch holding the bottle down, we can wait until the chemical reaction happens fully. And there's a lot of gas pressure in the rocket before... Three, three two, two, one... one. Woo! <laughs> that worked. Yeah, I hit the ceiling. Uh, I think we need to do this outside. Yeah, I think we definitely have to do it outside. All right, totally great. Weird. Anyway, I was saying we should put three or four of them. Three, two, one, go! <laughs> outside and it worked great. The only thing left was to max it out even more. So, larger chamber? Yep, more antacid. More antacid, more air, more water. Absolutely. Bigger rocket. Okay, so you know what? I know how to splice two bottles together and we can increase the size right. of the chamber. This is sodium acetate. How do you get sodium acetate? Well, when you do a vinegar and baking soda reaction, what you have left, once the reaction is finished, is sodium acetate. It's a crystal, and you can do something fun with it that may seem familiar. You make a super saturated solution of sodium acetate by heating water and dissolving as much as you can, and then when it cools, you can get the crystals to reform. Now, if you did this with sugar, you could make a sugar pop, which we've done before. If you do it with salt, you could make a salt pop which is less appealing. And if you do it with sodium acetate, you can do this. Just like with the sugar pop, all it needs is a seed crystal to get the crystals to reform. But unlike sugar, which takes a few days, sodium acetate recrystallizes right before your eyes. Because we heated the water, it allowed more crystals to dissolve in it. Ooh. But then it cooled down afterward. There's more crystals sitting around in this water than there should be at this temperature. They want to turn back into crystals, and all they need is something to start them going. I've colored this one green because, I don't know, science. Maybe it'll look cool. A tiny crystal on the end of the stick is all we need to start the reaction happening. Whoa! Wow! And there you go! Sodium acetate! Hmm. That one wasn't done yet. We've gone from small containers, oh yeah, to a large container, <laughs> to a rocket. <laughs> yeah! So what's next? Super maxed out rocket! Woo! 12 two liter bottles all spliced together to give us a very large chamber to build up pressure with. So the chamber is all the same, so it's all one big hollow tube, and now we're gonna fire it off. Let's go! Let's do it. <laughs> awesome rocket! Yeah! Lisa and I follow the same procedure as before. We use a bag of antacid tablets held up inside the rocket with a magnet. And once it's sealed on the launcher, we pull it off, let the antacid mix with the water, let the chemical reaction happen for a while to produce enough gas pressure, and then... We fire it! Okay, here we go! Three, two, one, go! <laughs> oh my god! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! That is the highest wow. I think we've ever shot a rocket on Science Max. That's amazing. Well done. Chemical reaction rocket. Thank you very much for joining us on Science Mass Experiments at Large. We should build another rocket, because that one so. is probably broken. That's done. Okay, let's go. Let's do it. All right, so this time, I think what we should need to do is... Ah! Oh, no, it's nothing but garbage cans in there. we got to turn the portal off. Come on, we got to get... Ah! 
Science Antacid, the perfect antacid for all of your science needs. So let's launch some chem. Let's launch. See, vinegar is a base, and baking soda is an acid. That's not right. <laughs> vinegar is an acid, and baking soda is a base. Science guy. Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. rotating and turning things around. From a giant spinning top, to perpetual motion, to defying gravity, and... The Magnus Effect! The Magnus Effect. It's all about to spin almost out of control on this episode of Science Max Experiment at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and this is Science Max Experiment at Large. Whoa. Oh, I better spin the other way. Today, we're gonna be taking a closer look at spinning. Well, all things spinning. Spinning, rolling, rotation in all its forms. And, ugh, ugh. When things spin, they're subject to a whole bunch of different forces. And some are strong enough to even counteract gravity. So let's get spinning! <laughs> oh. Okay, let's, let's get spinning! <laughs> We are going to make a gyroscopic whirly gig, and it spins, and I don't, which is a good thing. Watch this. You pull the string, and... Ah, it spins, and it stands on its end. Why does it stand on its end when it spins? Because of angular momentum, which we'll get to later. And here's how you can make one of your own. You will need some craft sticks, string, a small zip tie, a shish kebab skewer, spacers like these wood blocks, and finally some round discs, which you can cut out of plastic or find from parts of broken toys. Now, if you want to research this yourself, look up Gyroscopic Whirly Gig. Get two craft sticks and glue them to your wooden blocks just like this, and then do it again. Space them apart and glue them to crosswise craft sticks, and this will be your launcher. You put your hand in the small end, and the larger, the longer end here is where you put your gyroscopic whirly gig. Now let's make that. What you want to do is you want to take a shish kebab skewer or whatever fits the diameter hole of the round things that you're using. I like to use little plastic discs from, uh, these are from remote control mechanisms, but you can use anything you want. I found that this launcher works best with four discs of the same size. Just like that. Space them out evenly, glue them down, and cut the skewer even on both sides. Then add your zip tie, put it right in the middle, tighten it up, and cut off the dangling end. This zip tie just gives you somewhere for the string to hold on when you wind it up. Now for your pull handle. Glue two craft sticks and two wooden blocks, then two more craft sticks on the sides. Then tie a string to the middle, wrap that string around the middle of the whirly gig, and... Ha ha! You have a gyroscopic whirly gig, a pull handle, a rope, and your launcher. Now remember, you put your hand in like this, and you fit your gyroscopic whirly gig in just like that, and you pull towards you. And it spins! Oh, and that's what we're gonna be doing today, Science Maximites. We're gonna max out a spinning rig, something like this. It's gonna spin bigger, faster, more weight. It's gonna be totally maxed out. So come on. But first, I need an expert to help me out. So, let's see here. Um, oh, ah, wait a minute. Aha, perfect. Come on, this is gonna be great. Science Center, I'm really glad you're here. You're gonna help me max out the gyroscopic whirly gig. The, the what? Oh, the gyroscopic whirly gig. Here, I'll show you. It's this, and it spins, and what works in my... Phil, where are your shoes? 
I think these are my shoes. Mm. They must have changed into flippers in the portal. Did Weird. You wanna change them? Yeah, I'll be fine. Okay. Anyway, like I was saying, the gyroscopic whirly gig is uh, it's really good. I'm gonna, let's do it here so that I don't have to walk as far. Can I see it? Yeah, yeah, here it is. Ready? You spin it up and it spins and it goes for a while, right? Because you made it out of four discs, it probably spins better because there's more mass. More, oh yeah, because you know what? I actually have an old one. Yeah, I got an old one here with one disc and it does not spin as long as the four disc one. Could we test the one disc one out and compare it to the four disc one? You bet, because that, you know what that is? Science. science. Yeah, that's science. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try it. Ready? Whoa. Oh. Huh, look at that. The four disc one spin better longer than the one disc one because the four disc one has more. More mass, mass, therefore more inertia. So when we max it out, we should get something with a lot of mass. Yeah, more mass. Wait, I have something. Right, whoa, can you give me a hand? Careful, Phil, I don't, I don't want yeah. you to fall. Yeah, well, I don't want to fall either. It's hard to walk in these. I can imagine, that's why I asked you if you wanted to change Nah, your shoes. we're fine, I'm fine. Okay, check it out, this is what I was going to. Okay, this is what we can make it into our maxed out spinning gyroscopic. Uh, why not? I, it's, it's just, look at how, Big the hole is. Oh yeah, because we're gonna need something to be the axis, huh? Yeah, we need like a tree to fill that. I yeah, you're right. Work. Too big. Uh, is there anything else wrong with it? It's also kind of, kind of light. It's not that heavy. More mass, better. More mass. Okay, tell you what. Oh, I know. Hold on, hold on. I know, I know. Ooh. Oh, that looks <sighs> perfect. Yeah, and then we got this. Uh, pull. To go through the center? We'll go through the center like that. Awesome! And then we'll just weld it together, and there you go. This will be great! Yeah, high five! Uh, Phil. Okay, no, wait, sorry, sorry, yeah, you got the thing. High five! Oh, no, I got the thing. Yeah. All right, I'll get new shoes, and we'll work on our high okay. five. Okay. Now it's time for one of my favorite scientific terms, the Magnus Effect. I am Magnus, and behold my effect. No, the Magnus effect has to do with things that are spinning. Things like these cups. And here's a great little Magnus effect flyer you can make at home. It's super easy. Get two styrofoam cups and tape them together at the bottoms using science tape. Then get some elastic bands and make a long one by tying them together. Take your elastic and you wrap it around the cup like this. Then hold the elastic on the bottom, remember, like that, and then let them go. They fly up and out. The reason why it goes up and stays in the air is because it's spinning, creating moving air over the top. Moving air has lower pressure, which means it's pushed up by the higher pressure underneath. And that is called the... Oh, come on. Oh. Now, um, the Magnus Effect. Yes. So, let's max it out. Magnus it out. See how much better that sounds? No, 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 max, max it out. Check it out, Magnus Flyer 2.0 Stand Elastic Slingshot. Wrap it around. Remember, for the Magnus Effect to work, your cups need to be spinning this way, the front side rotating up. Oh, and there you have it, the Magnus Effect. Hi, Magnus, I'm out taking over the show. It is now Science Magnus. That is my effect, slightly improving the name of science TV shows. Science Magnus. Silita and I are maxing out our spinning top. Based on our small version, we decided to make one with as much mass as possible. So we got a 20 kilogram weight and welded it to a metal shaft. Will this work the same way? Well, let's look at the science. Why does a top spin? Well, let's start with Newton's first law, which is an object at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. But the in motion has another part. That object also wants to go in a straight line. If you think of a bowling ball rolling along, it would need another force to act upon it to make it change direction. We say that a moving object has momentum. Now, a top doesn't go in a straight line, it spins around, but it still has momentum. 
it's an object in motion. And even though it's spinning, it still does want to go in a straight line. It's just that that straight line is here. We call this angular momentum. To make a top move this way or that way would take an outside force. So it stays upright as long as it has enough momentum. But when it slows down, there's less momentum and it becomes harder to resist external forces like gravity, which will eventually want to make it topple. Our top has a lot of mass, which means it'll have a lot of angular momentum when it gets spinning. It's just a matter of getting it spinning fast enough. So should we spin it? Yeah, let's spin it. Let's You're see spinning. if we can get it to work. Hey, hey. Spin, 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 spin. Are we gonna let go? In three. Wait, wait, wait. I can't get it. What? Go! Oh, wait, wait. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, Not fast enough. We need something to help us get it spinning faster. faster. Maybe a rope? A rope, yeah. Grab a rope. That was my like idea, too, a rope, because the small one uses a rope. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'll go grab a rope. So, wrapping the rope up. I'll let you wrap the rope okay. up. I'll get my holder back on top. Spin it counterclockwise. We attach the rope and wind it up. You want to make it super clean. This is some of the best coiled rope I've ever seen. I'm going to pull the rope. You're going to hold on to it, but I can't okay. pull really hard because you won't be able to hold it up. Because yeah. we don't have to pull hard. We just have to get it going fast. Yes. Silita so keeps her hand on the block at the top, and I pull. Ready? Wait a minute. We'll get all the way. Oh. Whoa! It's spinning a lot better than I thought it would. <laughs> it's still spinning, but it's wobbling. Uh-oh, careful. Oh, there it goes. It works, but just barely. It might spin better. It might spin straighter. Yeah. If we had it spinning, something help us spin it, spin it faster. Yes. Um, faster with more power. Faster with more power. Mm -hmm. Mini bats. This is a string. You can pull a string, but you can't push a string. Well, you can. You can push a string. You really can. Okay, quit it. Quit it. This little contraption works sort of like a baseball pitching machine, but in miniature. See, there are two motors here, and the wheels spin together to shoot things out this way. Things like this craft stick. Watch this. Whoa! Let's watch that again. Whoa! <laughs> but now, watch as I put a large loop of string through. What? <laughs> Pushing string. How does this happen? It... Hello? I don't suppose it's the Magnus effect? Uh, no, it's not the Magnus effect. No, that's... It's all right. I'll be in my lair if you need okay. me. Okay. Right. Bye. Right. Where was I? Uh, I believe you were at, uh, the reason why this works is... Right. Pushing string. How does this happen? It's all because of inertia. Check it out. The wheels are pushing the string through fast. It's got some weight and it's got some speed, which means it has some inertia. So when it goes this way, it wants to keep going this way. But it goes all the way to the end and then, because it's a loop, gets sucked back in this way, which means all of this inertia, you can sort of overcome gravity. Pushing string. Science. Silita and I need to get our maxed out top spinning faster. We try to rope, but now we're trying a drill. We get a wheel on our drill and use it on the outside of the weight to get it spinning up. A little faster. Oh, it's coming now. A little more. Okay. And release. Whoa! It's, it's kind of cool that it wobbles that much and it, it doesn't does. hit the ground. It worked better, but there's always a way to max it out even more. You know what we need, Silita, what is do we need, a maxed out drill. Put it right on the top here and get it spinning very, very fast. Super maxed out gyroscope okay. whirly gig. gig. Is it just the top now? Gyros I don't know. Do you want we to keep it? We could call it a gyroscope. Gyros well, it's, it's sort of a toppy, kind of gyroscopy. This is a bike tire. It's pretty light, but I still can't hold it from the end of the pole like this with one hand. Ugh, nope, nope. But I can if I get it spinning fast enough. I just use this drill, and then I get... Okay, so this is gonna be awfully hard to do with one person 
Uh, oh, this is the perfect opportunity to use the Trevor button. Ha <laughs> ha, Trevor button. Hey, Trevor, from the Science Max build team, uh, what are you doing? Maxing this out. Oh, right on. Can you give me a hand for a second? Sure. Awesome. Okay, so you take this, this drill, and we're gonna get this wheel spinning really fast. Okay. I don't know if it's, um... No, no, I don't wanna know. I don't know if I remember to... No, it's fine. Max it out. We gotta max it out. So, because it's spinning, I can hold this heavy weight in the air. How is this possible? Because the wheel is basically a top. The forces that prevent a top tipping, angular momentum, are still working here. This angular momentum resists a change in direction this way, which is how gravity would want it to tip. Interestingly, these same forces also keep it spinning around me in a circle. So, I can lift the heavy weight in the air just by spinning it. Awesome max head experiment, Trevor. Yeah! What was that? It's my science confetti high five I just made. Well, you know what we should do? What? We should max it out. Yeah, we can make a giant one and then a whole bunch of confetti in it, and then people like jump up and do more confetti that would come out, right? And then so what would happen is there would be all this con Trevor? Silita and I have maxed out our spinning top. The trick is getting something that heavy to spin really fast. We've tried a rope and a drill, but now we have a maxed out drill. So more power and more speed, which is perfect for spinning this massive top. Yes, and perfect for maxing out anything. We get it spinning and it works great. The top spins for a really long time. In fact, its mass was so large, it started drilling a hole in the concrete floor. We tried it again, but started to notice something. The drill is smoking quite significantly. Our drill began to overheat. Why? Good old Newton's first law. An object at rest wants to stay at rest, and an object in motion wants to stay in motion. The more mass we have in motion, the longer it will stay in motion. This will go forever. Well, not forever, well, not forever. But it'll go a really long time because it's got a lot of weight. But that same mass wants to stay at rest when it's not moving. We have to overcome all that mass wanting to stay at rest to get the top spinning. And even for our maxed out drill, that was a tough job. But once it was spinning, there was only one thing to do. Max it out even more! Silita and I come up with a plan to max out the top by riding it. You want to ride the top? Of course I want to ride the top! We can both ride the top. One person's going to have to drill this, so we'll have to take turns. Max Historica. This is Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest scientific minds the world has ever seen. And this is a wheel. Da Vinci thought to himself, wouldn't it be great to design a wheel that kept spinning forever? So he got to work. Something to keep spinning forever without stopping is called a perpetual motion machine. And it was an obsession of da Vinci's. Why, this is great. The bottles tip the water to the outside, making one side of the wheel heavier, which will keep it spinning forever. <laughs> Except it doesn't work. You see, what Da Vinci doesn't know is that science says a perpetual motion machine is impossible. But of course it wasn't for another 350 years till scientists figured that out. So we can't tell Da Vinci. Uh, what? Oh, uh, never mind. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest inventors ever. Even if not all of his inventions worked. <laughs> Silita and I got our maxed out spinning top to work pretty well. The only thing left to do was to ride it. We attached a large disc and a Lazy Susan. That's a platform that spins around on ball bearings. Lazy Susan on top. Lazy Susan. So then you can ride on it. Yes, and then we wanted to add this extra bit. Now, why did we want to add this? We need a little bit more um, weight on our top. Okay, so who gets to ride it? Um, I feel like you should ride it. I think you might be because right. Because I want to use oh, the drill. The super awesome maxed out drill. Okay, so let's do it. First thing I should say is do not, do not try this at home. We are trained scientists. Silita uses the drill to get it spinning while I hold it steady. 
Oh. Then I hold on to our safety line above and carefully rest my weight on the top. It works, but not for long. We take turns trying it out, but it seems we have another part of science working against us. Good old friction. Friction with the air and with the ground is what eventually slows the spinning top down. But our weight on the ball bearings of the Lazy Susan really increases the friction. More friction means the top slows down a lot faster. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> that was pretty cool. That was kind of terrifying, right? Yeah. Good old Newton's first law kept the top spinning, angular momentum kept it from falling over, and friction slowed it back down. The forces were always the same, no matter if it was a little top, a maxed out top, or a rideable one. There you go, Science Max! Experiments a large, giant spinning top. That's as spinning, that's as large a spinning top as I think you I think in the entire world. Let's do it again! Yeah! Ha ha ha! Ha 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 ha! Ho ho! Science madness! Over to you. It's quite difficult to do with gloves on. Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. This episode of Science Max is all about vibration and frequency. Frequency and vibration. What's the difference? We build a maxed out vibrobot, spin a giant disc, suspend water, and play with lasers. All on this episode of Science Max, Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites, and welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're gonna be looking at vibration. Vibration is when things go back and forth, back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> All kinds of things vibrate, like pendulums. Pendulums. Wait, wait, and pendulum. Pendulums are designed to swing back and forth. Stop that. Also, metronomes. Me oh. <laughs> metronomes are used by people when they're when they're practicing music to keep accurate time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Putting it back. And okay. We're gonna be building. Whoa, okay. We're gonna be building. <laughs> this little guy, this is a vibrobot. And he vibrates and he skitters around on the paper. And if we take the caps off the markers, he makes interesting patterns on the paper. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Let's build a vibrobot. Oh, yeah, you know what? Maybe it's time to take off the ski boots, huh? Oh. Whew. There we go, that's better. So today, like I said, we're gonna be making a vibrobot. And here are all the materials you need to make your own. Plastic cup, three markers, an electric motor, just make sure you ask an adult first, a battery, a plastic drink bottle cap, a toothpick, scissors, this kind of tape is called electrical tape. Science tape, which is the same as invisible tape, but of course I use this tape only for science. And some modeling clay. And these are two bendy straws that I've taped googly eyes to. These are not necessary. I just like them for decoration. Now remember, if I'm going too fast here, which I probably will be, you can get all of the steps on how to make your very own Vibrobot on our website. Okay, so here's how you get started. First, you're gonna make the feet 
for your VibroBot. So I attach some science tape to the markers, and then I put the marker on the bottom of the cup. And then I do that again to the next marker, and then the third, balance it like that. There. Next thing you want to do is take your plastic drink bottle cap and make a hole with a toothpick. You want to make it off to the side, right about there, just like that. That's so when it turns, it will be off center. That's what's going to give us our vibration. So once you've made that hole, take some modeling clay and stick it in the cap to give it some weight. When you've done that, stick it onto the shaft of your motor like this. See how it's off center there? Now we just need to attach it to the, I just put it on top, and I like to attach the battery to the back of the cup. And now, finally, we're going to attach the eyes. We take some science tape. Draws are over here. I am Vibrobot. I am here to vibrate. Take me to your leader. So then, you attach your tape with the wire to the top of the battery there, and then the other wire to the bottom of the battery. Just like that, and let your VibroBot make some art. <laughs> now, if the battery is new, your VibroBot might be jumping up and down quite a bit. So you can do what I like to do and add some more weight, and then you make better lines with your VibroBot. And your VibroBot makes art. How long will he last? Probably till lunch. And there you go. Vibrobot art! Art made by a robot! How cool is that? So that's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna meet Chris from Logics Academy, and he's gonna help me max out the Vibrobot. Plus, we're gonna learn a little bit more about vibration. Come on. Oh, hey, Chris. Oh, uh, oh hey, Phil. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Okay, here's your Science Max lab coat. Thank you. So you guys at Logix Academy, you also build a VibroBot, right? That's right, we do. This is mine, and it works pretty well. That's awesome. So, I want to max this out. Cool. So I thought we would start with, instead of this motor, we would start with this motor. Wow. It used to be a round circle, but I cut it off so that it's off-center. Perfect. I've also got, this is our battery. Fantastic. That's as far as I've gotten so far. Well, it looks like we need a frame next. Right, something to be the cup. That's right. So we just need some sort of larger cup. Ooh, how about that metal shelf over there? Oh, this thing? Yeah. This is just something I keep my parts on. It's perfect. Really? Yep, the shelves will house everything that we need, and it looks like it'll be strong enough to hold everything together. Now, the VibroBot had markers on the bottom of it. That's right. To make a little pattern. Should we try that with this? Because we're going bigger, what if we used paint and paintbrushes instead? OK, sure. We could attach paintbrushes to the legs. Pass me one. All right, so now all we need to do is get some paint and some paper. That's right. And uh, we can fire it up. Okay, let's, let's move it over this way. Vibration and frequency. What's the difference? They're all connected. Ta-da! Now, whoa. Wow. Vibration is things going back and forth. Back and forth. And back and forth. It's a cycle. Cycle, 25 bucks. Oh, yeah, it's the wrong kind of cycle. Never mind. Well, if that's vibration, then what's frequency? Well, frequency is a measure of how fast or slow, how frequent those vibrations happen. Look at this bowling ball. It is swinging back and forth, but not very fast. You could say it has a low frequency. We measure all kinds of things by the frequency. This thing is terrifying. When you turn the dial on your radio, you're tuning in to different frequencies of radio waves. Hey, look at this punching balloon. It's going very fast. You could say it has a high frequency. <laughs> so, now you know. Vibration is something going back and forth, and frequency is how quickly it does it. Yeah. Ramona, the bowling ball keeps coming through everything. How do you turn it off? OK, back to our main experiment. Chris and I are taking a VibroBot and maxing it out. We have a large motor and a battery, and we're taping it all to some shelving. 
Just like our small vibrobot, our motor needs something to make it unbalanced when it spins. That's what will cause the vibrations. It's just taped. I haven't attached it in any other way. Do you think that's OK? As an engineer, I have superior faith in duct tape. OK, well, that, that's good to know. We're also adding an on-off switch and some paintbrushes on the bottoms of the legs so our maxed out vibrobot can make art just like the small one. The final step, dipping the brushes in paint and setting it on a big piece of paper. We fire it up and it immediately shakes everything off the shelves. Oh! oh it, it totally spilled all the stuff on the shelves. The motor shakes the vibrobot a lot, but there's a problem. All that shaking is starting to take its toll on the shelves. The wheels come off, the screws come out, and finally... It totally shook it's itself apart. Destroyed itself. The shelving unit just completely falls apart when it's being shaken. Vibration is really hard on the structure of an object. We need something more sturdy, something that can, that can take weight. Steps, maybe? Yeah. OK, hold on. OK. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this looks much better. Okay, great. So we build the new Vibrobot out of this. So more paint brushes, bigger motor, more paint, more everything. More everything. All right, good. This is a pendulum. It's just a weight suspended on a line and anchored from above. Pretty simple. Pendulums were used for hundreds of years for all kinds of reasons, but most famously in clocks. Why were pendulums used in clocks? Well, here's why. Let's mark every time the pendulum hits the bottom of the swing right here. OK, watch. All right, now here's the question. How fast will the beeps be if I swing it from much higher up? Let's find out. No matter how high the pendulum swings, it keeps the same frequency. That's why they were used in clocks, because it could swing for a long while, and even though it would lose energy, it would still keep perfect time. The frequency of a pendulum doesn't change, no matter how high it swings or how much weight is on the bottom. The frequency comes from how long the line is. Now this is a pendulum wave. Because each bowling ball has a line that's a different length, they have a slightly different frequency. They start out swinging together, but soon they start to make interesting patterns. Remember, each pendulum is keeping its own perfect time, even if it's slowing down. It's only the length of the line that gives each pendulum a different frequency. And now, we're gonna max it out with with, um, well, I guess these are already bowling balls, so this is already pretty maxed out. I'm just gonna, just gonna leave that there. These are balloons. This is a laser, and these are awesome laser safety glasses. Now, lasers are made of light, and light has a frequency. In fact, each color of light has a different frequency. This is a red laser. Check it out. Yeah, cool. This is also a very powerful laser. Oh, I can pop the blue balloon with the red laser because the blue absorbed the red light from the laser and then it heated up and the balloon popped. But here's the cool thing. I cannot pop a red balloon with a red laser because the red balloon reflects the red light from the red laser and I can't pop it. If I wanted to pop a balloon with a red laser, I need to use a darker balloon, one that absorbs the red light, like <laughs> like a black balloon. <laughs> so there you go. Lasers, frequencies of light. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this red balloon because it's always nice to have a balloon. <laughs> Chris and I are maxing out the Vibrobot, but our last version shook itself apart. Now the plan is to start with something more solid and try again. We found some very solid steps and added an even bigger motor, an even bigger battery, and attached a half circle wheel to make the vibrations when the motor spins. We add some paint brushes and fire it up. Here we go. Come on. Go, Vibrobot. Hmm. 
wants to move. Is it moving at all? Hmm. Hmm. So it's still not working. It's sort of getting caught in the paper, and it's on the paintbrushes. And the, yeah, the paintbrushes seem to be absorbing too much vibration, and then the paper's stopping it as well. So why don't we remove the paintbrushes? Yeah. And we might as well remove the paper if we don't have any more paintbrushes. Yes. And we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Okay. No paintbrushes, no paper. Okay. Now let's try it. Three, two, one, go! Yeah! Aha! It's moving. Not bad. The shaking is good, but I don't know if the shaking is enough. So what do we do? Well, we could add another battery. Another battery, which would give it more power? That's right. OK, let's try that. OK. OK, so it wasn't working before. No. Not enough power. And now we've got a second battery here. That's right. We've wired them up so that one power feeds into the other, so we've got twice as much juice as we do. So it's just a matter of clipping this onto there. That's right. But hold on. Yeah, safety glasses, because now we don't know what's going to happen anymore. Ready? Three, two, one. The extra battery makes a big difference. The new VibraBot shakes around and only shakes itself apart a little. All right, Whoa. that was amazing. <laughs> okay, so all we needed was more power. That's right, I think it didn't have enough power to, to vibrate up and down and that's why it wasn't moving every time it hit the ground. So I think if we're gonna use this much power, I think we need to build it again. Okay. Build it even stronger and with a bigger motor. Yeah. And more power. And then maybe I ride it. Do you think we can build that? Of course. Of course. Okay, let's do it. You want to see something cool? I can make this water levitate. Defy gravity using the power of science. You want to see? Behold! <laughs> gravity defying water. I can even make the water go very slowly. Or I can make the water go back up into the hose. Or I can make the water completely stop. <laughs> you know what's interesting? The water does not seem to be stopped for me. You see stopped water because you are looking at it through a TV camera. See? Real life TV camera. Real life. TV camera. You see, movie cameras and TV cameras take a whole bunch of still photos and run them together really, really fast. 24 times a second for our TV cameras. I have created a device that drops water at 24 times a second, and what happens is everything lines up. So it looks like the water drops aren't moving. But watch this. I grab the hose and it's fine but I let it go, and the hose is vibrating back and forth at exactly the same time the camera shutter is going back and forth, and everything looks like it stopped. The power of frequency has defied gravity. Okay, so not really. It's kind of a camera trick, but I prefer to call it science. Here's a fun way to play with things going back and forth. This is Euler's disc, and it's designed to spin like this. What's going on is friction and gravity are slowing that down and pulling it towards the Earth. Now, you don't need a fancy disc like this to do this at home. All you need is a pot lid. Check it out. When the pot lid spins, friction and gravity start to slow it down which means each spin gets lower and lower, and the frequency gets higher and higher. But the difference between a pot lid and Euler's disc is Euler's disc is made to go for as long as possible. The heavy puck has a slightly rounded edge and sits on a glass surface that is slightly concave, like a bowl. All of this is designed to make Euler's disc last a really long time, which is, which is, quite a while. But eventually, friction and gravity pull the disc down, and finally, it stops. Pretty amazing, right? Well, wait till we max it out. 
This is Trevor, head of the Science Max build team. Hey. Thanks for setting this up, Trevor. So what is this? This is a giant side of a spool, big hydro spool. OK, so this is the largest disk that we could totally find. And we've got it all hooked up here. We lift it up, we spin it, and then you pull the thing, and it will drop down and, and spin like a coin, because it's the only way we can do that with something this heavy. Yeah. Ready? I'm ready. OK. Trevor and I hoist it up and get it suspended above the ground. Yeah. Then I start to wind it up. Ready? When it's going fast enough. And go, Trevor! Trevor pulls the release and... It turns out a 200 kilogram spinning disc works exactly the same. As it spins and rolls, gravity and friction work on it, and the frequency speeds up as it gets closer to the ground until it stops. Giant Oilers disc. Nicely done, Trevor. That was awesome. That was great. Let's do it again. All right. Our Vibrobot was working well, so that means it's time to make it way bigger. We started with a big metal table and added a huge motor, one 20 times as powerful as the last one. Instead of batteries giving us 12 volts of power, we're going to use a plug, which is 10 times more power. We've added an off-center wheel for vibration, bolted the motor to the frame, and added a protective cage all around to prevent anything from flying off. It even has a seat for me to ride. OK. OK. You ready? Ready! Here we go. We fire it up, and it's very shaky. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. That was really uncomfortable. <laughs> oh. It was, like, very bangy, even with the, even with the seat. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to try standing on All it. All right. When I try standing on it, the Vibrobot lives up to its name. It vibrates all around the lab. Oh, wow. My legs are numb to, to the knee. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Bye, robot! All right. Yeah, that worked really well. That was awesome. I can't, I really can't feel my feet right now. And it held together, which is impressive. That's right, the more power and the stronger structure paid off. Yeah, I, the only thing I regret is not getting a chance to, wait a minute, wait a minute, come with me. OK, so I achieved my dream of riding the Vibrobot. You did. But we never got a chance to make art. So we've dipped a whole bunch of nuts and bolts and heavy things in paint. Yeah. And now we're going to turn on the Vibrobot and see if we can make some art. <laughs> Let's see how it looks. Oh, wow. Ta-da! Vibrobot art. Vibrobot has been a huge success, and we've got some art to keep. High fives. Well done. Science Max, experiments at large. Who gets to keep the art? Uh, rock, paper, scissors. OK. One, two, three. OK, tie. One, two, three. Tie. One, two, three. One, two, three. Wow. One, two, three. Ah, oh, tie. One, two, three. Man. There's going to be a red balloon, but those red balloons are going to be pushing this way. And then this afternoon, we're going to have this blue balloon, which is quite nice. Over to you, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Science! I figured we would have maybe a bigger motor. Yes. Or a bigger, no. I'm going to try that again. <laughs> All thrusters ahead. Whoa! <laughs> Balloons. <laughs> science! Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> yeah! My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max Experiments at Large. Science Max! Newton's third law is the science behind balloon powered rocket cars. It's also the science behind a maxed out rocket car that I can ride. Plus bowling balls and an interrupting sign. Today on Science Max, experiments at large. 
Greetings, Science Maximites. I am Phil McCordick, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be experimenting with the balloon-powered car. Here's how it works. Woohoo! It all has to do with Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, we don't, we don't have to do this now. We can, this is all for later. We can build the cars first and then we can, uh, let's go over here. So how do you build a balloon powered car? Well, I suggest you be science maximites because there's any number of ways you can build a balloon powered car. You do not have to follow my design. You should come up with one of your own. It may even be better than the one I built, but I will give you some tips though that make it a lot easier. First of all, you need something to stick your balloon on that has an opening on it. I used a turkey baster for this car. I just pop the top off, and remember to tell an adult that you're using the turkey baster. And then you stick the balloon on there, and it allows you to attach something to the car, and it also makes it easier to blow up the balloon. <laughs> you can use any number of things, even just uh, any kind of tube that you find lying around. It helps you attach the balloon to the car and it helps you blow up the balloon way easier. The other thing you should think about when you make your balloon powered car is how you're going to make the wheels roll. Once you've decided on the base of the car, you could use anything, even just a piece of cardboard like this, you can do your wheels in two ways. The first way is to attach the wheels to the axle. This is how I made the axle of this car. I used a shish kebab skewer and I stuck it inside a straw, just like that. And then I attached the lids to the shish kebab skewer. So the lids and the shish kebab skewer are attached and they rotate in the straw. That's one way to make the wheels turn. The other way is to tape down the axle or whatever you're going to use uh, and have the wheels spin around on the axle. Two great ways to make your wheels turn and it really kind of depends on the wheels you're using. You can make your own design and keep refining it and making it better and faster or do what I like to do and make a whole bunch of different cars. So we've got this one. Uh, this one I made out of paper plates and this is a snorkel. Awesome. This one is the rock car because there's a rock on it. I've got uh, the dragster model. It's a long broom handle, and it might not work that well, but who, who knows? And this is my favorite design. It's made out of waffles and an ice cube tray. This is why I make a whole bunch of different cars, because I can race them. Sunday, 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 at the Science Maxidrome. It's the balloon-powered car winner-take-all drag race of awesome. First up, the Eliminator. Better late than never, it's the Procrastinator! <laughs> Crushing the competition, it's the Terminator! Feel the chill of the refrigerator. <laughs> All right! And last but not least, the um, regurgitator. Well, when you build your balloon-powered cars, you can figure out what worked or uh, what didn't work and try modifying your designs to make them work even better. That is science. And now we're gonna max it out because this is Science Max Experiments at Large. So we're gonna take that small balloon-powered car that we just built and we're gonna make it much, much bigger. I'm gonna go to the Center for Skills Development and Training and we're gonna use the science behind the small balloon-powered car and we're gonna make it big. That science is Newton's third law, but there's Newton's plenty of third law. No, there's, for every there's, there's there plenty of time for this later. We're not reaction. doing, we're not doing this bit now. We're doing that bit in a minute. 
so we could. Wait, wait, no, I, I said we're doing it later. We're doing it later. <sighs> Whoa. Uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, Phil. This is Sarah, and she's got a master's degree in physics from McMaster University. Right. And we're going to be talking about Newton's third law. Ooh, look out! Look out, duck! Uh, sorry. Sorry, there was a sign that kept coming in. Um, never mind. Newton's third law. Well, what is that? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right, so how does that work with our balloon car? Ah, cool. Okay, so if you blow up the balloon, what's gonna happen when you release it is the air is gonna push out with a certain force, which in turn is gonna cause the cart to move forward with the exact same force. Yeah, works great. So how come it doesn't work with my rock cart? Ah, wow. Well, actually, it did work. So the balloon still pushes with the exact same force, which causes the cart to have the exact same force push forward. But your rock is really heavy, so you probably didn't see it move. Oh, so a lighter cart works better with the same amount of force. That's it. Well, there you go. Newton's third law. What? Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. I'm really starting to dislike that sign. Phil, are you OK? Yeah, I'm fine. Our small balloon-powered car works because of Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The air pushing out the balloon this way pushes the car with the same amount of force this way. So, in order to max it out, the plan is just to get a bigger wheeled cart and a much bigger balloon. So, everything should work out the same. Okay, so, sir. Oh, I thought what we would do is I would, in order to max out the balloon-powered car, what we need is a cart to start with, and then I ride it. And we have a giant balloon, and then I go. Do you have a giant balloon? Ha! <laughs> giant balloon! So, step one, uh, Sarah blows up the balloon. Okay. Use this air compressor, it'll probably be a lot faster. Sarah and I get to work blowing up the balloon, and it takes a long time. A very long time. Okay, human-sized balloon-powered car test. Take one. All right, Sarah. You got it? Yeah. Okay, let it go. Okay, go, go. Let it go. I and did. You did let it go. I just let go. Nothing is happening. It's not coming out fast enough, and you're a bit too massive. I don't think it's going to work like this. Really? Yeah. OK. Uh, balloon powered car test two. No fill. I'll just take it. And... <laughs> what happened? Uh, I don't think it worked. The balloon popped. Phil, are you OK? This is why you wear protective eyewear. Uh, yeah. So that didn't work? No. No. Should we get another balloon? Uh... I think uh, we need something else. OK, well, the air coming out of the balloon just well, didn't have enough force, so. We need the air to come out with more force. Yeah, do we get, what, a bigger a bigger balloon? I don't think that's going to work. I don't think it's that. I think we need something with compressed air. Oh, like a scuba tank or a? Fire extinguisher, something like that. Yeah, that, that's what we need. OK, sure. Well, we can, all right, so I don't know if that's safe to do that. So we'd have to build, a, like, a cage or yeah, something? Yeah, I don't know if it's going to work on this. All right, well, back. Back to the drawing board. So okay. what we should do is we should get up. We need a, to find these tanks. You get the tanks, and then we make a, like a frame out of aluminum or something. OK, that could work. Yeah, That's they can hold idea. the tanks, so yeah. they're safe. And then what we should do is. Who was Isaac Newton? He was a mathematician and probably number one on the list of top scientists of all time. Albert Einstein said, Isaac Newton was the smartest person that ever lived. You've got to be special if Einstein is calling you smart. Newton's three laws of motion was a huge idea, but did you know Newton also came up with the idea of gravity? The famous story is that in 1666, Isaac Newton was sitting under an apple tree when he watched an apple fall and wondered why. Hey everyone, I just invented gravity, which was a big relief because up until then, everyone was just floating around. <laughs> 
Okay, so it didn't happen like that. He didn't invent gravity. He gave a name to this invisible force and then described how it works. Not only did it make things fall down, but it was the same force that kept the moon circling the Earth and the Earth circling the sun. And he invented a new kind of math to explain how. We now call it calculus. See, I told you he was smart. He's very smart. This is hydrophobic coating. Hydrophobic literally means afraid of water, but it's not actually afraid of water. The chemistry of a hydrophobic coating prevents water molecules from penetrating anything you spray it on. You can get this stuff at the hardware store, and if you want, be science maximites and get an adult and think of the coolest thing you could spray with hydrophobic coating. I like to use things that do not go well when you put them in water, like uh, tissue. Yeah, doesn't look great when it gets wet. Here's a tissue coated in hydrophobic coating. Huh? Weird. Or it works the same with a paper towel. Paper towel in water, paper towel covered in hydrophobic coating, stays dry. Or how about a dinner roll? Dinner rolls really don't like water. See? Gross. But a dinner roll coated in hydrophobic coating? Weird. Just don't eat it. Now, it's time to max it out. I have coated half of my lab coat in hydrophobic coating, and the other half, I have not. Hydrophobic coating, regular lab coat. Half of me is wet, and half of me is dry. What's more, half of my outfit ended up being wet and half dry because the lab coat was protecting my outfit from getting wet. Now it's time to max it out even more. We have coated my entire outfit in hydrophobic spray. My shirt, my pants, and my lab coat. The pants have been taped to rubber boots, so no water's getting in there. And my shirt has been taped to my pants, so no water's getting in there. So here's the question. Can I get into the pool and out of the pool and stay dry? Let's find out. In the pool, out of the pool, and I'm still mostly dry. Now here's what really happened. I got into the pool, and I realized I should have duct taped the pocket, because all the water went in there, down into the rubber boots, started filling up the rubber boots, and now my entire leg is full of water because the hydrophobic coating isn't letting it come out. So the hydrophobic coating isn't keeping the water out, now it's keeping the water in. Let's take a closer look at Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. OK. All right, let's watch it back. When the sign hits me, I exert a force on the sign in the opposite direction. That makes the sign stop moving. It also exerts an equal force on me, causing me to fly off in this direction. Now, if I was to push this sign, I'm not only pushing the sign this way, but my feet are pushing against the ground in the opposite direction. It's, um, well, it's really easier to see if I'm not standing on the ground. Um, oh, hold on. Okay, so, huh? Oh, okay. So now that I'm hanging, watch. I push on the sign, but when I exert force on the sign to make it go this way, I go that way. Well, actually, it's, it doesn't work as well because the sign isn't as heavy as I am. So wait, I have this over here. This is a, a barrel, and it has stuff in it, and it weighs as much as I do. OK, so watch. If I push on the barrel like that, I go away from it as much as it goes away from me. So. There you have it. Newton's. Newton's third. No, hold on. Newton's. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. OK, go. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So using a giant balloon to push me on a cart uh, didn't work. And I, ah! What happened? <laughs> The plan now is to use the compressed gas cylinder. Just like a balloon, these cylinders contain a lot of air. 
If we get a cart and put a gas cylinder in a cage for safety on the back and open the valve, the escaping air might have enough force to push me. This is two cubic meters of air. If we were to put it in a balloon, the balloon would be this big. But if we compress the air, we can fit it all into one of these, a steel tank. This is what we're gonna be using next for our air-powered car. Got it? Yep. All right, Good. so Sarah and I have been hard at work and we've built the air-powered cart. We can't call it a balloon-powered cart anymore because now we've got a compressed air tank, so it's not a balloon that powers it. Exactly. Okay, so I'm gonna sit on here, Sarah's gonna turn on the tank, and I'm gonna go. And before we do this, we should say, do not, under any circumstances, try this at home. We are trained professionals. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, high five first. Okay, now we do it. Okay, so before I turn the tank on, make sure your feet are down and the brakes are on. Gotcha. Uh, Don't take them off till I say go. You have got it. All right. Ready? Okay. Yeah, it did work, but I feel I feel like it could work better. You want to go faster? I do want to go faster. This reminds me of the rock car. Yeah. Well, we didn't have a big enough balloon. We need more force. We need more force. So should we get a bigger tank? Let's get more tanks. More, more tanks, more force. You're gonna go faster forward. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. High five. All right, let's do it. All right. Newton's Cradle, and it's a really cool toy that demonstrates all kinds of laws of motion, including Newton's third law. Newton's what you do is you pull this one ball out, and when it hits these balls, they exert force on that ball to make it stop moving, but it exerts force on these balls, which travels through the balls and makes this one on the end fly out, like that. Now, there's a lot going on here, but you can really see how the force is equal that you put in and you get out if you use two balls. I swing two balls up, and two balls go out that side. Isn't that cool? Now, it wouldn't be science max unless we maxed it out, so come on. Whoa! Okay, this is one we built out of bowling balls. Bowling balls. Bowling balls. <laughs> Instead of smaller balls, and I think it's gonna work the same way. Let's find out. You throw one out, and, and <laughs> yeah, it works the same. Okay, now let's try it with two balls. Okay, ready? Wait, 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 wait. And two balls, throw them out. And two balls on that side. All right, so there you have it. Whoa. Newton's third law. Oh. Ah. Newton's ah. third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So our single pressurized tank created enough force to move me, but not very fast. The plan now is to do two things. First, we're going to triple the amount of thrust by using three tanks. We're also going to use some pipes that lock into each other to give me an initial push. These pipes slide together, and when the air is turned on, the pressure in the pipes will cause them to slide apart, which will push me forward. After that, I use what's left in the tanks to keep going. All right, now it's time to max it out. I've enlisted the help of a few more Science Max people. Thank you very much, Corey. You'll see now we have three tanks of compressed gas, and we've also got this nifty little contraption. How does this work, Sarah? All right, so each tank is attached back, to a tube, yeah. and you can see that each tube goes into this one main tube, so when we turn them on, pressure's gonna build up, and we're gonna go forward with more force. Well, that's great, and Reed is stacking cinder blocks. Thanks, Reed, uh, up so that will push uh, the pipe will push against the cinder blocks, and then I'll go that forward. way. All right, well, are you guys ready? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Now, again, I have to say, thank you, Corey, I've got it. This is something you definitely don't want to try at home. We are all trained professionals. We have a physics degree here. We've got TV people that make sure that this is safe. So uh, watch it and enjoy, but please don't try any of this at home. Okay, I'm ready. Sarah, count me down. 
three, two, one. <laughs> that was awesome! That was really awesome! All right, high fives, high fives! Yeah, 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 yeah! And it's raining now, so it looks like we're gonna have to stop. So thank you very much for joining us on Science Max Experiments at Large in our episode on Newton's Third Law. Science Max is a show where we take small experiments and do them big. If you want to try these experiments yourself, go to our website for instructions. But not all the experiments on Science Max are the kind you should try at home. This one, yes. This, no. Try this, don't try this. A big yes, a big no. I, I don't know how you could possibly do this one at home. And remember, if you're ever not sure, ask an adult. Thanks for watching Science Max Experiments at Large. Wait, I can play Mary Had a Little Lamb. It's working! It's working! <laughs> Newton's cradle at a bowling ball. Come on! You know this one. Sing along. Whee! Come on! I mean, come on! Science! Yay! Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max Experiments at Large. This episode of ow, Science Max ow. is all about elastic energy. We use it to build a catapult and a paddle wheel boat, and then we max them out. We even learn some history. Elastic energy, today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. I'm Phil McCordick, and today we're going to be building one of the most devastating, one of the most powerful machines known to medieval man, using a plastic spoon, among other things. We're gonna be building a catapult. Catapults were used throughout history for all kinds of reasons, to throw all kinds of things, but mostly big stone blocks at castle walls in order to knock them down. Here's what you need in order to build your own catapult. You need elastics, uh, pencils, uh, unsharpened is fine, plastic spoons, like I said, and popsicle sticks. Popsicle, popsicle sticks. Popsicle sticks. Um, I'm gonna go wash my hand. So here's the science behind what we're doing today. It's all about elastic force. Elasticity is a property of solid materials, like this elastic, and how much they tend to return to their original shape when deformed, like when I pull on it. Elastics are called elastics because they're great at doing just that. You can pull on it and pull on it and pull on it, and it'll, ow, 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 always return to its original shape. So we are using the power of elastic force today. Ow. Now it's time for a Science Max quiz. Elasticity is the ability for a material to return to its original shape when deformed, like this or this. Which of these materials have elasticity? A rubber band, a pencil, or a rock? Haha! -ha, this is a trick question. The answer is all three. Most solid materials have elasticity. Nearly everything will deform a little and still be able to return to its original shape. It all depends on how much. This is a steel bar. This is an elastic band. And this is an ice cream sundae. We're not talking about ice cream sundaes now, though. So get that out of here. Good. Now a steel bar and an elastic band both have elasticity. A steel bar can be stretched to 1% of its length and still spring back. A rubber band can be stretched 300% or more. 
The difference between the two is why we make balls out of rubber and buildings out of steel. Because the other way around wouldn't be good for balls or buildings. This has been a Science Max Quiz. All right, let's build our catapult. The first step, take four pencils and stick your popsicle stick in between so you have two on the top and two on the bottom. And then use your elastic to go around and around and around. That's why I like building things with elastics because it makes it very fast to tie things together because once you go around and you have it nice and tight, you just pop it over the end and voila, it stays together. And that is how you start making your frame. Put more pencils on that side. And another popsicle stick on the other end, held on at the corners with more elastics. Then take even more elastics and put them right around the middle until you get this. I've added a few more elastics around the middle here, and that is where we're gonna get all of our elastic force. I think I have six. The more you use, the better it's going to work. Take your popsicle stick, stick in between the elastics, and then start spinning it around. Here's the reason I use pencils and popsicle sticks is because the pencils are a little bit longer, which allows you to twist the popsicle stick around in the middle and build up the elastic force. Now, because I'm twisting, the elastic force we're using here is called torsion or twisting force. When you feel you have enough torsion, pull your popsicle stick down a little bit so it won't unwind on you, and you'll see that you have all kinds of elastic energy. Then take your spoon and stick it on the popsicle stick, and you can also break off the popsicle stick if you want to make sure it's the right length. And it works like that. To make the frame, you just need more pencils and elastics. The trick is to make a triangle with two pencils attached to your frame. They should stick up right where your catapult arm would be fully upright. Then take a final pencil and put it across the top. Don't forget to pull the arm back before you put the pencil across, otherwise it'll end up on the wrong side. Now this is very complicated and I went pretty fast, so if you want the step-by-step -step instructions on exactly how to build this, go to our website. And there you go, a catapult of your very own that you can use to knock down very small castle walls. I've also built a larger catapult using all of the same principles. Pretty good, huh? It's got a longer arm, which means I can throw marshmallows even further. Whoa. Or I can throw larger marshmallows. Or I can throw very large marshmallows. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, is that the largest catapult you're gonna make? Well, of course not. This is Science Max, experiments at large. I'm headed to the center for skills development and training, and we're gonna max out the catapult so that it's big enough to throw one of these. Hey, Phil. How you doing? All right. This is Zach. He's a mechanical engineer, and you build machines for a living, right? That's right. Great, because I need help building a catapult. OK, but what's with the pumpkin? Well, the pumpkin is what I want to throw out of the catapult. Um, see, I figure we just take the small design, and we just make it so that we can throw one of these. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You're going to need a really big catapult. Yeah, and I'm also going to need some really big elastics. Where do you get those? Well. In medieval times, they used rope to make large catapults. Oh, okay, well rope is a lot easier to get, and that would be fine. Uh, and I want to make this arm uh, as long as this piece of wood here. This is going to be a huge catapult. It's a huge catapult. I guess we should build it outside, though, huh? Let's do it. Okay, it's, it's over that way. Okay. Right, I'll follow you. Sure, do you want a hand with that? No, no, I'm fine. You go ahead, and okay. I'll, I'll just... Maybe if you hold the door open for me, I could... Just hold... No, it's... You know what? You go and I'll, I'll meet you. Make sure you go. Our full-size catapult is going to look a lot like the popsicle stick version. We start with a four-sided frame and add some legs on the bottom. Our spoon is going to be replaced by a long throwing arm with a basket on the end. Then we need a really strong cross brace at the top to stop the arm. 
Just like in the small version, using a triangle shape is the best because triangles are very strong. Finally, we need something to wind around and around, which is going to give us our elastic force. Instead of elastics, we're gonna be using rope for our catapult because rope has just the right amount of elasticity. But unlike medieval times, we're gonna be catapulting pumpkins. Once Zack and I got it all put together, it looked like this. Okay, we have built a catapult. Check it out. It's pretty solid and I think it's pretty amazing. And just like in the small catapult, we have our elastic force. But this time we're using rope, right Zach? Yes. Okay, and rope will work as well as the elastic did in the small one? Yeah. All right, great, so what do we do? It's really well, loose we now. We need to wind this up so oh, that we put some God. tension okay, into it. Up. Go! The reason a catapult works is because the rope is twisted. The elasticity in the rope wants to unwind, which gives the catapult its power. Just like the small wind catapult, it. the more you wind it, the better it works. Good. Usually in medieval days, they had whole teams of people doing this job, <laughs> but it's just me and Zach now. How are you doing, Zach? All right. Okay. And then we clamp it on here. So the thing doesn't unwind, right? Yeah. Good. All right. Now we have our pumpkin, and we're going to fire our pumpkin in our castle wall, which is made out of cardboard boxes over there. Pumpkin. All right, here we go. Pull on the arm back. Oh, oh. that elastic force is pretty strong. Okay, how do you think, we're, you think that pumpkin's a good size? Oh, uh, it's pretty big. You think? Oh, a little it's too big. Too, it's too big for our basket. Yeah. Smaller pumpkin, smaller pumpkin. I'll hold this. No rush, Zach, no rush. Oh, okay, uh, rush, Zach. Uh, can't hold, Oh yeah. Man. can't hold arm. Okay, ready? One, two, three. It didn't work that well. No, um, it that well. Yeah, so it went and it flew and it landed here, which is a little farther yeah, away from the wall than I'd short. like it to be. One third of the way to the wall. I don't know if that's enough. What do we do to make it better? Well, the way we're throwing it right now, we just have the pumpkin in a, you know, at the end of the arm. So yeah. if we bake, make some kind of a sling so that we fling it as we're bringing it up. We make a sling? Yes. All right, I don't know how to make a sling, but you know how? Sure. All right, we'll make it, and then you can explain how it works. Yeah. All right, good. Let's put the pumpkin over here. We'll put it, we'll recycle it later. Max Historica. Good morrow to you. I am Lord Fillington III, and welcome to my medieval castle. Throughout history, lords and kings have built castles and walls to keep people out. I built my castle to protect my prize collection of snow globes. I have so very many, and they're all mine. <laughs> oh, hello, you down there. You can't come in, this is my castle. And through our history, there have been people who've been wanting to get into those castles because Lord Fillington has been hogging all the snow globes and I'd, well, I'd like to look at them. But the odd part is figuring out how to get into the castle, because I can't just come up to the wall and start hammering on it. Huh? Taste the wrath of my water balloon! Because, because if I get too close to the castle, he can get me. Ha 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 ha! Fortunately, there's this thing called a catapult. Oh, fiddlesticks. They have a catapult. What you do is you put something heavy in the end here, and the catapult fires it at the walls of the castle, knocks them down, all from far enough away that the people in the castle can't get to you. Ah! Oh, I surrender! Don't knock my walls down! Oh, it'll take me all week to fix them! Oh! All right, all right, you can have a snow globe. <laughs> and that's how catapults were used in history. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> Back to our maxed out catapult. Our first design threw a pumpkin just like it was supposed to, except it only threw it one third of the way to the wall. Now Zach and I are planning to outfit the catapult with a sling. 
The sling attaches to the end of the throwing arm and gives the pumpkin a lot more distance to travel. Because the pumpkin is traveling a longer distance in the same amount of time, it will be going faster, which will hopefully get it to the wall, or at least a lot farther than before. So we built this sling. How does this work, Zach? Well, we've got one end tied here. Yeah. And then we put the pumpkin in here. Wait, wait. OK, pulling arm down. Pulling arm down. <sighs> OK, yeah, now what? Now we put the pumpkin in here. Put the pumpkin in there. And yeah. And we loop this over the back of the, oh. over that. As the throwing arm goes up, this will slide off the back of the throwing arm and it will release the pumpkin. All right, you're the expert, I believe you. Let's try it out. Three, two, one. Oh. Whoa. OK. That Better. works really well. You know what the problem is, though? We still don't have enough oomph. Yeah, it needs more power. Need, well, so what do we do? Should, I don't know if we can crank that rope anymore. Uh, I think we're at the limit of our rope power, but if we added some more elastic. I thought we weren't going to use elastic. Well, we used elastics in our small demo models. What if we use some more? We have got, elastics? Uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I brought have... some in here just in case. What's this? It's uh, surgical tubing. It's like a giant elastic. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess this is elastic force. So do we, do we twist well, here, it we around can... at the bottom there? Well, we or? just wrap it around the throwing arm like this. And... Oh, I see. So we tie yeah. it here. Yeah, we just need a lot more, and then... And then we pull this, and it would be... Oh, yeah, that would yeah. make a lot more. So we just need a lot more of this elastic... Uh, what, is, what is this again? Surgical tubing. Surgical tubing. It's like a giant elastic. Fantastic. All right. Goggles on. Goggles on, yes. Yes. Mini Here's another fun way you can play with elastic force. Take a milk carton... I prefer Science Max Milk because it's the creamiest. 2% cream, 100% science. Wrap some elastic bands around it with some popsicle sticks on the bottom, sort of like feet. Then take some clamshell packaging, which wraps just about anything you buy nowadays, and cut out a square or a rectangle. Then wrap some tape around that square with an elastic in it and put the elastic on the feet of your milk carton. Then wind it around and make sure you go backwards so your paddle wheel boat will go forwards when you put it in the water. And there you go, a paddle wheel boat. Now it is time to max it up. Elastic Force Paddle Wheel Boat Mattress. I need, I need a, a better name. But I've made a giant paddle wheel boat that will work on Elastic Force because I've got surgical tubing as my elastics, and that's an air mattress. And then I use some lumber to hold it all together. And of course, I need a paddle wheel. And what better thing to use in a pool than a flutterboard? Okay, here we go. So normally you're not allowed to wear your clothes and your shoes in the pool, but I got special permission because of science. Besides, I'm not worried at all, so I didn't wear my swimming outfit because I figure I can totally do this entire experiment without even getting wet. That is how confident I am. All right, now the tricky part, We'll be getting on to the mattress. OK, here we go. Ha <laughs> ha! Whoa. Ha <laughs> ha! The SS Science! Hey, SS Science, that's a great name for this. Look, it works great. And I managed to stay totally dry. Huh? Well, almost. Whoa, oh, oh. <laughs> you thought I was going to fall in the pool, but I didn't. Uh-oh. My flutterboard has, has stopped moving, and I'm, I'm in the middle of the pool. Almost. Yeah. Didn't think this through. No. 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 No, that's not going to work. Maybe I'll... Maybe I'll wait. Our maxed out catapult was working well with the sling we attached to it, but it still didn't make it all the way to the wall. Zach's idea is to attach a bunch of surgical tubing to the cross piece of the catapult. 
Surgical tubing is pretty much big elastics. So we'll have two places we're getting elastic force from, the rope and the surgical tubing. Hopefully this design is enough to help our catapult fling a pumpkin far enough to hit the castle wall. All right, here we go. Uh, you hold that, I get this. We got our system down now. Okay. This goes up to there. Okay. Okay. Three, two, one. Uh, nope. <laughs> uh. One, two, three. Uh. Oh, oh. Uh. <laughs> it went too far. <laughs> it went too far. We are, that's so good. Oh man. All right. Okay, uh. so all we gotta do is move the catapult back. So you get that side, I'll get this side. And hey, we'll move the catapult. See, now our catapult is too good. We gotta back it away from the castle. All right, let's go again. Aha, pumpkin. Pumpkin. Pulling arm back. Pulling arm back. Uh, grunting. Floating pumpkin. Floating. Hooking rope on arm. Hooking rope on arm, more grunting. More grunting. Uh, pulling back strongly. One, two, three. Uh, Oh, 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 wow! Woo! We're inside the castle. We're still inside the castle. Oh, man. It's an excellent shot, though. So what do we do, move the catapult back? Yeah. Move the catapult back! Right about right here. here. Here we go again. Pumpkin! Pumpkin? Loading arm. Loading arm. All right, you ready? You think it's gonna work? We've got, we've done every modification we can possibly do. So you think it's gonna work this we time? We did it, it's gonna work. Okay, here we go, I'm excited. All right, ready? Ready. One, two, three. Whoa! Yeah! Woohoo! High fives! Well, there you have it. Awesome job. Now we need to throw fingers to see who gets to rebuild the castle. Okay, one, two, three. Oh, thanks very much for joining us. Let's just take a break, I'll rebuild the castle. <laughs> you see, this is exactly how catapults used to work. They'd hit the same part of the wall over and over until they made a big hole and that would weaken the wall. Fortunately for me, it's really easy to fix. Uh, just put this right in here. Oh man. Uh, the pool will be closing in five minutes. No, no, I'll do it. No, no, I'll wait you last Taste the wrath of my water balloon! I don't believe it really sells it if he doesn't smash the water balloon. Does he? Good morrow to you! <laughs> I got my feather in my, my face. Oh, you gotta be kidding me! Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Today on Science Max, it's all about gas pressure. Low pressure, high pressure, good ideas. A nucleation fountain. And bad ones. Let's carbonate pickle juice. All on this episode of Science Max, experiments at large. Greetings, Science Maximites. Today we're using fizzy drinks in our experiments. And a fizzy drink is just water with bubbles of carbon dioxide gas dissolved in it. So I thought since we exhale carbon dioxide, I could make a fizzy drink by just blowing bubbles in this water. Doesn't seem to be working though, does it? I don't see any bubbles, do you? No. Hmm. Water does absorb carbon dioxide gas, but I don't have a fizzy drink. 
Weird. Time to check the book of science. Oh, in order to make bubbles, you have to have pressure. So... This is an air compressor. It takes air and compresses it, puts it under pressure. So... Hmm. The container needs to be pressurized. Okay. When you get a container of a fizzy drink, the carbon dioxide gas is put in there under pressure, and it stays in there under pressure until you release it. That's the sound of the pressure being released. And when it is released, the carbon dioxide gas starts to expand. And when it expands, it creates bubbles. And that's what makes your fizzy drink. This process takes a while to run out, but eventually it will become flat. No more bubbles. But what if there was a way to release all of that carbonation all in one go? Well, there is. And for this experiment, all you need is your favorite brand of fizzy drink. Science Max brand, Diet Science Cola. 100% science, zero calories. And your favorite candy, like these science experiments. All the minty flavor that comes from pure science. So, all you need to do is open this up. Open this up. Take one of these and put it in here with an adult's permission because it can get kind of messy. Whoa! What's going on here is all of the carbonation that was in the bottle is now being released much more rapidly than it would have been before. Now, why does this happen? Well, if you look at a carbonated beverage, you'll see that the bubbles don't come from everywhere. They come from the inside of the glass, or in this case, a lot are coming from the straw. And that's because the carbon dioxide bubbles like to find a little imperfection, something to hold on to in order to expand and bubble out. And a candy such as this has a ton of little tiny microscopic imperfections. So when you drop it in, there's a lot more places for the bubbles to attach, and that makes the carbonation happen a lot quicker. But remember, this is not a chemical reaction. It all has to do with carbonation. So that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Air pressure, more pressure, less pressure, and of course, we're gonna be maxing out this experiment. All right, I just need an expert to help me max this out. Let's see, um, oh, Cynthia from the Ontario Science Center. She'd be perfect for this. All right, good. Okay, come on, let's go. And, yep, that's good. Hey, Cynthia! Hey, Phil, Cynthia, going? from the Ontario Science Centre, you're gonna help me max out the science experiments and diet science cola experiment. Yeah. I, I think we need a better name for this. Okay, well, we have the mints that have tiny little pores called nucleation sites on them. The gas inside the cola is gonna go through these nucleation sites, create a giant fountain. Uh huh. So why don't we call it a nucleation fountain? Ooh, nucleation fountain, I like that. It's it's accurate and it sounds awesome. There we go. Okay, so uh, we want to max it out. So how many should we put in? Let's say five more nucleation sites. More reaction. Ah. I tried adding more mints, but one at a time didn't work. It doesn't. No. It's not. It, the bubbles are pushing it back out again. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> and then, yeah, I think if we put them all in at the same time, it would work better. So we came up with a delivery mechanism to get all the mints in at the same time. A tube with a magnet holding the mints up, which we screw onto the top of the bottle. Pull the outside magnet to release, and... Oh, nice. oh yes. Oh, yeah. That's a good fountain. That is a, a good, good nucleation fountain. Nucleation fountain worked very well. There we go. Cynthia and I decided to try some other ideas to max it out even more. We decided to do some... Experimentation. Experimentation. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Yep. And see if Diet Cola was the best carbonated drink to use. We tried four different kinds. Diet Cola, regular cola, lemon lime soda, and club soda. So really just... It's just carbonated water. Carbonated water. Three, two, one, go. Whoa. Oh! Oh! Science <laughs> Cola. But I think that... Uh, it was close. I think it was the release. Let's watch the replay. Okay. 
Yep, Diet Science Cola went the highest. So the next step is maybe if we want to max the size of the fountain, we have to make a narrower stream. Ooh, so um, a smaller aperture opening will be higher pressure. That's what I'm thinking. Because it'll be forced at a smaller opening. What else can we do? We can launch it. We could launch, oh, you mean like sideways? Yeah. Yeah, I love that idea. So we'll put it on wheels. We'll put it on wheels. Okay. And then we'll launch it sideways. Okay. These are, we got a lot of things to do. Okay, let's get. We, we need just, time, let's do it. Get to it, okay, okay, we'll go to the lab. I'll get a mop. Nothing like a fizzy glass of water. And now there are ways for you to carbonate water at home with something like this, the Science Max Carbonation Station. You have a bottle of compressed carbon dioxide gas that's hooked up. You take a bottle of tap water, attach it, and carbonate it. Voila, carbonated water. But this is Science Max. Why just carbonate water? Let's carbonate everything! Let's carbonate pickle juice. <laughs> it's actually amazing. <laughs> milk. It's like milk meets water. Kind of very odd. Chocolate milk? Oh no, that's way better. <laughs> Carbonated mustard. <laughs> carbonated tomato juice, carbonated hot sauce. No, wait, carbonated, that was the hot sauce. <laughs> no. <laughs> carbonated clam chowder. Oh, there you go, carbonation. Not just for water anymore. It is definitely not for clam chowder. No, that's just a big bowl of no. Never again. Cynthia and I are maxing out a nucleation fountain. Yes! Oh, that's yeah! That's a good fountain. We're changing our design a bit to see if a smaller hole in the bottle cap will make for a higher pressure fountain, which will make it more maxed out. We have uh, this large hole. Uh, we've got a medium-sized hole. We have a very small hole. So we're gonna see large, medium, or small, which one is the best. To max out our fountain. Exactly. But the problem is that our old delivery mechanism won't work if we keep the cap on. So we needed to come up with a new delivery system. So we drilled holes in the mints and put them underneath the cap on a pipe cleaner. They hang at the top of the bottle until we pull the pipe cleaner and then they fall in. All right, are you ready? Oh, I'm so excited. Which one do you predict? will be the best. This will have a larger geyser. These I think this will, will look cooler yeah. because it'll be big, but this one? The smallest hole I think will go the highest. Yeah, ready? Three, Three two, two, one. one. Whoa. Whoa. Definitely the biggest. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, careful, careful, careful. This one is almost like a spray. It's not like a mist. Yeah, it's a, a mist. mist of cola. <laughs> they all kind of work a little differently. The interesting thing is this this one, <laughs> this one lasts the longest. Oh, 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 oh. There we go. So, this was this was cool, but not the best. This one's still going. It's still it's going. It's not over yet. You gotta give it points for still going. <laughs> I think this fountain looked the best though. This one was pretty good. So uh, a small aperture, but maybe not the smallest aperture yep. would be the yep. best. Um, so because of the force coming out of here, I think that we could probably do something like putting it on wheels. And, and shooting, shooting it. it like a rocket? Yeah, let's, let's on see. On wheels? Uh, or like a car. Oh. Yeah, we'll make a, a nucleation fountain car. The Nucleation One! It's our race car. It's our race car. It's got fancy wheels that spin really well. And we decided to go with the medium aperture. So it's fairly big, but not too small. Yeah, all we need to do is unscrew that, put that in there, and then pull it out. Three, two, two, one. Oh, good, good, good. Let it go. Whoa. Oh, that's not so bad. Oh, <laughs> yeah! Oh, no. Missed the finish it's, line. It's past the thing. <laughs> turn it around, turn it around. Oh. Whoa. Do you think we can make it get to the finish line? It, it, there, it's been oh, a, no. spinning out. Oh, wow. Uh, go, go. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs>
It worked pretty well, but there's always more ways to max it out. What if we just got like a, a giant container? Hmm. Like, because we're using small containers, right? What if we just so got a really large container? you want to carbonate container? a very large container. Well, we'd have to figure out some way to, well, come on, let's go figure it okay, out. Okay, let's do it. is an egg. It's been hard boiled and peeled, so there's no shell on it. This is a flask, and this is hot water. I pour the hot water into the flask, which means the air inside the flask starts to heat up. And when it heats up, it expands, and some escapes through the top of the bottle. I pour the water out, and then I cap the flask with the egg. Now this expanded air is starting to cool again, which means it's lower pressure, which means the higher pressure on the outside of the flask pushes the egg in. Ha <laughs> ha, fun! And then, to get the egg out, you... mm -hmm. Ah, I can reverse it. If I blow into the flask, I can increase the pressure inside. <laughs> Science! And now let's max it out. Max out container! Okay, pour out the water. Oh, careful, careful. And now I put this water balloon on the top and we'll just see what happens. The hot expanded air inside the container is cooling and reducing in pressure, which means the higher pressure outside the container, it's happening, pushes the balloon in. It's happening! Oh. <laughs> Maxed out! Hmm. Did you know that we live on the bottom of an ocean of air? It's called the atmosphere. And compared to the Earth, it's really thin. I mean, it's about as thin as this. Huh? Huh, look at that, not very thick at all. But it's a good thing the atmosphere is around and not just for breathing. So I am a fan of breathing. What do we want? Breathing! When do we want it? All the time. But did you know the atmosphere has different layers? It's true. I will walk you through them. No, I mean, come on, you gotta, you gotta come with me. I'm walking over to walk you through them. Okay, the troposphere. This is the layer where we are all existing right now, where all of our weather happens. There's a lot of air molecules in this layer. Think, think of these balloons as air molecules. There's a lot of air in this layer. <laughs> Yay, air! Next layer, the stratosphere. There's less air molecules in this layer, and it's where jets fly. Next layer, the mesosphere. There's even fewer air molecules in here, and it's where meteors burn up and turn into shooting stars. Fire, 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 fire! <laughs> the thermosphere. Not many air molecules left up here, and this is where the northern lights, the auroras happen. <laughs> northern lights. <laughs> And finally, the exosphere. This is as high as the atmosphere goes. This is where satellites orbit, and if you see any air molecules up here, they're just passing through. Hello. And after that, nothing but the vacuum of space. Ooh, the vacuum of space. Of course, you know it's not that kind of vacuum, right? Right, vacuum just means no air. There you go, the atmosphere. The only thing separating us from the vacuum of space. <laughs> Roberta, your space vacuum got broken. I don't know how. Oh. Cynthia and I are maxing out the nucleation fountain. Whoa. This one is almost like a spray. It's not like a mist. Yeah, it's a, a mist, mist of cola. Just to experiment, we tried using a giant bottle and pouring the Diet Cola in. I'm a little concerned about the science, but it didn't work. Well, that's not very exciting. Uh, 
Okay, so that didn't work at all. No. This is not a chemical reaction. It's a physical change. So it's the carbonation that matters. Exactly. When we poured the cola into the bottle, we lost almost all the carbonation. How are we gonna max it out? That's the question. So if we can't make a larger container, more bottles. We just have more bottles. So we'll just exactly. get a lot of them and we'll set them off in a sequence or something. Okay, let's do a pattern or something. We'll uh, max out the fountain. I know fountain. We You know, we should be sort of like our cascade and we'll get a, ooh, a lazy Susan or, or. This is a vacuum chamber. It's an airtight container and I put a hose on it and the hose is attached to a pump. Now the pump takes the air out of the chamber, creating a vacuum. So, let's have some fun putting things in a vacuum chamber. Marshmallows in a vacuum chamber. The marshmallows grow larger. Whoa! Then shrink much smaller when returned to normal pressure. <laughs> Why? Well, take a look at what happens with this balloon. The vacuum takes the air and the pressure out of the container, which was pushing against the sides of the balloon. Without that outside pressure, the air molecules inside the balloon can expand. So let's max it out with maxed out marshmallow. Just like the balloon, the marshmallows expand. But unlike the balloon, the air in the marshmallows escapes. So they shrink when the pressure is added back in. They're almost the size of regular marshmallows. It's the air inside a marshmallow that makes it fluffy. Which is not very fluffy. The same expanding process happens with marshmallow cookies. <laughs> the marshmallow has completely deflated and it's all kind of hollow inside. The frosting on a cake. More cake! No, no! Oh! Mm, look at this giant birthday cake. I can't wait to eat it. No! <laughs> and even shaving cream. <laughs> no! Shaving slime. Cynthia and I have done a whole bunch of different experiments. Experiments. To find out how to max out the nucleation fountain. So we'll just exactly. get a lot of them and we'll set them off in a sequence or something. Okay, let's do a pattern or something. Now we have a bunch of bottles and we're ready to try the maxed out version. We've got our, our release mechanism. With our medium aperture. Yep, and uh, we're gonna put the mints in all of the bottles and then we're gonna release them in a very coordinated. Pattern. Re rehearsed pattern. Very rehearsed. We've rehearsed it a couple times. We'll see how it goes. And we've got this lazy Susan, which will spin around and we'll see how it goes. And three. Two, two one. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. seven. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Surprise. One, two, oh. Go, 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 go. Three, four. <laughs> Fountain, that is as good as it's gonna get. So let's recap. Our nucleation fountain is all about releasing the carbonation in our diet cola faster than normal. This happens because there's lots of tiny bumps on the mints for the carbon dioxide to grab onto and make bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> High fives, Woo! there you go. Science Max, experiments at large, nucleation fountain. Excellent job. Now all we need to do is, is clean it clean up. Clean up and I think I need a shower with water. Yeah, I think I need at least the towel. Yeah, okay, but it's let's... supposed to volumize your hair. Is it good for I your hair? So. I yeah, hope so. Yeah, better than honey and things like that. I don't... <laughs> awesome. You guys gotta try this, it's so good. Whoa. Carbonated jelly. Oh, that's so horrible. <laughs> Please, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I don't want to do it.
Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Science Max! This episode is all about friction. Yeah, friction! Keeping things suspended up high thanks to friction, like this. And this. And even me! Okay! Climbing, sliding, lifting, and falling. Uh, falling? I guess not yet. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. <laughs> Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and today we're talking about friction. I didn't slide. Take two. I can't. I'm still not. Oh, I, I know. I know. I got it. Take three. Oh, socks don't work any better. Take 15. <laughs> 34. Take 36. I don't know why I thought that would work. Take 52. I'm Phil, and today we're talking about friction! Oh! <laughs> friction! We did it! We got it, everybody! How many takes was that? Oh. Well, still, we got it. Good work. <laughs> As you may have already guessed, today is about friction. And here's a really easy friction experiment you can do at home. All you need is a piece of wood. You don't need the frame, and you don't have to uh, do anything fancy to it. Just put one end up on a couch or a coffee table and make a nice ramp. Then you want something to slide down that ramp. And I like to use a piece of wood. Now check it out. Wood ramp, wood block. The friction is so much that the wood slides to there. Now what I like to do is take a little flag and mark the results. Recording the results is good science. Now here's where it gets fun. Get another surface and attach it to the wood, like carpet and wood. Let's see how far this goes. Hmm, not as good. All right, record the results. Cardboard. Ooh, nicely done, cardboard. Foam. And this wood has been waxed, like on a floor wax, which makes it nice and slippery. Let's see how that does. Ooh. And now the ultimate ice attached to wood. This is actually harder to do than I thought. All right, let's try it out. Ice, the clear winner. Not a big surprise right there. And get this, once you've done all of that, you can change the surface of the ramp. You can go to waxed wood, carpet, foam, cardboard. But, and, and well, yeah, you get the idea. Record all the results, compare them, and there you go. Friction ramp experiment. And that's what we're gonna be maxing out today. So come on, let's go. Check it out, I've improved the portal interface. Watch this. <gasps> yeah, and then I can scroll through experts and oh, this is gonna be fun. And I've got my coordinates right there. Oh, um, that's never happened. Okay. Sarah, from Mad Science, you're gonna help me max out friction! Yeah, friction! What do you think of my max out friction room? It's amazing, it's so wonderful. So how are we gonna max out friction today? In the lab, I had a ramp, and I had um, stuff with different surfaces on it. Oh, that's so cool. It's too bad you don't have it here. We could totally test that out. <laughs> I can bring it here. Awesome. I have a new app on my phone that talks to the portal. And let's see. And, ha, and, huh. Hmm. That's not there's, what I, oh, hold, hold on, hold on. Okay, there we go, and, whoa. Uh, well, I can do this, I just, um, it needs an update. Yes. That's what the, yeah, oh, there, there we it go. is, okay. Perfect. 
So here we go. Amazing. The friction ramp, it's pretty simple. You just take, um, I've got blocks uh -huh. of wood with different surfaces. Amazing. And then you just slide them down the ramp. Right. So cool. Yeah. So what if, um, to max it out, what if this is us? We're a block of wood? No, I mean like we are on the block of wood oh. and then we can tr try changing the bottom. I guess a block of wood isn't the right thing to use though. Right, yeah, maybe we could use like a, like a sled. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. like a, right, uh, like a snow sled. Mm. That's a great idea. Okay, so yeah. we'll tell you what, I will portal in a sled for are us. Are you sure you wanna portal it in? I'm sure, just okay. stand, just stand back okay. though. Okay. Ha! Ah, there we go. Max out friction slide! You ready, Sarah? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. All right. Sarah and I pushed each other around on the sled, which was fun, <laughs> but it was also tiring. It's, uh, it's pretty hard. This is a... Uh, my turn. My turn. All right. Oh, yeah! Whoa, friction! Yeah, friction! Yeah! Yeah, friction! But we soon realized it'd be pretty hard to measure how much friction there was. You know how hard you were pushing? Like, I had no idea how hard I was pushing. A lot, but that doesn't really help in science terms, so. Exactly. What do we do? Well, with your first experiment, you used a ramp. Could we maybe put a ramp up in here? In here? In here, yeah. I guess. Uh... Then we can measure also how far we go so we know how much friction is being used. Uh, right, so we have our control and then we have all the, just like the blocks. Exactly, just like the blocks. Okay, great. So we'll get the ramp, we'll get a bunch of wood, yes. we'll get some tools. Yeah. The case of the missing friction! It was rough all over in the big city. My toughest case yet and I felt like I was getting nowhere. Someone stole all the city's friction. And it was my job to find out who and get it back. But after a week, I was no closer to solving the case. It was hard to get anything done now that there was no friction. Uptown to downtown, people were sliding all over with no way to stop themselves. It was chaos. Chaos, I tell you. But if there was any detective that could solve the case, it was me. <laughs> but it's like my grandma always said, it's tough to follow leads if you can't sit in your chair. <laughs> Nothing stays put in a city without friction. And you never appreciate something till it's gone. The phone rang. Sure, I wanted to answer it, but it slipped through my grasp just like this case. The mayor was on the line. He wanted to know if I'd made any progress. But I felt I was going in circles. I, I'm a little... I'm gonna have to call you back, Mr. Mayor. Without friction, you couldn't do very much at all. It was going to be my toughest case yet. Sounds good. Sarah and I are maxing out a friction ramp. Step one, make a giant ramp. There, are we done? Hey, I think so. We're done. But it proved a bit hard to lift up to the second floor. Fortunately, Sarah had an idea. Maybe we could use this crane. We use the crane! Yeah. Oh yeah, I've got a five ton crane at Science Max headquarters. Good thinking, Sarah. So we rigged it up and tried it out. The bonus was we could make the ramp any angle we wanted. Okay, time to get my helmet, because don't go any higher than that, because I don't have my helmet. And then we will start sliding down. All Friction right. room! Friction. I got on the slide, and Sarah lifted it up until I started moving. Ah! <laughs> and that allowed us to record our results. We're at two meters. Two, two meters. meters! Recorded. <laughs> First recording done, All now right. we switch it up. We tried it again with Sarah on the slide to see if she slid at the same height. And she did. Yeah. <laughs> now we have a way to record the results. The plastic sled went down the ramp at this height. Things with more friction will mean the mark is higher, and less friction will mean the mark is lower. So then, we tried it with... Cardboard! <laughs> cardboard! What did we get? And it was? A little over two meters. Meaning? Cardboard is a little bit less slippy than the plastic of the sled. All right. Ready for carpet sled? Good to go. Here we go. Oh, fast two meters. Right. Oh, almost three. Here we go, here we go. 
Carpet had even more. Oh my gosh, we're going to the side. <laughs> that was so cool. <laughs> that was exactly three. Then we tried foam. Coming up on two meters. And just like the wood block, the foam didn't slide at all. What if I like do this and then I slide? <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> right, so, um, friction sled uh, on foam, highest friction of all of the materials. Oh, hello there. I Whoa. Uh. Here's a fun science experiment you can do with science and friction together. Take two books, put them on top of each other, and pull them apart. Ooh, not too much friction. But if you take the books and you interleave some of the pages, maybe three or four parts, and try it again, pull them apart, they're a little harder to pull apart. That's because the friction for more pages touching each other actually starts to add up. So, what if we were to take two books with a lot of pages and very carefully and meticulously take each page individually, one at a time, and overlay each one and go back and forth? These are two books completely shuffled together. The elastic band is actually just to hold the covers together. All right. So, now, the friction between all of these pages, when I try to pull it apart, makes it pretty much impossible. Now, there's two things going on here. First of all, when you start to pull the books apart, the pages start to stick together because they squeeze together, because you're pulling and they're squeezing. And the fact that there's so many pages sticking together, the friction builds up to a degree that is actually very impressive. But. Don't take my word for it. Let's max it out. Here is another two books, elastic just to hold the covers. This one clamped to the wall, and I'm gonna pull this one. <laughs> Science! Still don't believe me? Well, let's max it out some more. Two books, all the pages layered together, held together only by friction, suspended over a giant bat of slime. Now, <laughs> let's see how much faith I have in science. <laughs> friction, yeah! Okay, okay, oh no. Okay, now to get down. Okay, hold on. And then... <laughs> Science! <laughs> that was close. Sarah and I have used our maxed out friction ramp and compared the regular sled to cardboard and foam. What's next? We've waxed the bottom of this sled and we're gonna try a wax sled next. Wax sled! All right, here we go. One meter. Oh boy. 1.5 meters. Whoa! Oh. Wrestling! Woo! Woo. Oh. The slipperiest yet. Yeah. Only 1.5 meters. That's awesome. Do we have anything that's more slippery? Yeah, we do. We have ice sled. Are you ready to try it out? So ready to try it out. Okay, let's do it. All right. That was so cool. And only 1.25 meters. Least amount of friction. Ice wins. Ice so wins. I think we should do something else to max this out, though. Maybe bringing it up a little bit more and yeah. using something with less friction. Wait, I have an idea. Um, yeah, OK, come with okay. me. This is a climbing frog. Why does he climb? Because of science. I pull on this rope, and then I pull on that rope, and I pull on that rope, and that rope, and he climbs 
up the ropes. And why? Well, because of friction. The secret is two straws. The straws are pointed away from each other at the bottom. This allows it to climb thanks to friction. Take a closer look. When I pull on one string, it pulls straight, which makes the frog pivot. That string slips through the straw because there's not a lot of friction. But there's lots of friction on the other side because of the angle. So one side of the string goes down, which makes the other go up, which means the frog goes up with it. All thanks to friction. So now, let's max it out. This is a super maxed out climbing frog. Just like the small version, I have a rope going through two tubes. I pull on one rope and the other holds on by friction. Then I switch. And it does work. It's just a lot harder to pull on the ropes. But it totally works. Whoa, careful. Whoa. There, and then this one, and then that one, and then that one. Yeah! <laughs> a giant climbing frog! <laughs> <laughs> All because of friction. Here's another way to defy gravity using friction. Get a plastic water bottle and fill it with rice. Take two. So get a plastic water bottle and fill it with rice using a funnel. Then take a shish kebab skewer and stick it into the bottle and nothing happens. <laughs> but if you tap the bottle down, the rice starts to pack in a little bit better. See how the level of rice is lower? Which means you can add more rice. Pack it down even more. And you can even use something the same diameter as the mouth of the bottle, like say a highlighter. And make sure all the rice is as packed in as you can get it there. Now the rice is really packed in there. And when I stick the shish kebab skewer in, the friction between the pieces of rice and this wood is enough to lift the bottle using nothing but friction. Now, let's max it out. I filled this 20 liter water cooler jug full of rice and it's really, it's really heavy. I wanted to see if I could lift it using nothing but friction and this dowel, which is just a round piece of wood. All right, here we go. Ah, <laughs> science! I'd max it out even more, but I don't think I could lift anymore. It's okay, I could just fit. Um. Newton's first law in 60 seconds. Newton's first law says an object in motion tends to stay in motion. So, why don't they? See, if I was to throw this, it doesn't stay in motion, it doesn't keep going, it slows down and falls to the ground. Well, the whole law states an object in motion tends to stay in motion until an external force acts upon it. So what forces are acting upon this? Well, gravity for one, pulling it down towards the ground, and friction, specifically air friction, slowing this down and making it stop. Now, if you were to have something very light with a lot of surface area, it would really be affected by air friction. You wouldn't be able to throw it very far at all, no matter how hard you tried. So there you go. Newton's first law, an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless it's affected by an external force such as friction, like air friction. So there you go. Sarah and I have recorded a lot of results on our ramp by raising it till we started to slide. Here we go. Now we've decided to raise the ramp to the highest point and see how far we can go using some low friction things, like a wheeled cart. I've made a double bike cart. Wheels are great for moving. They have rolling friction. Ready? Which is different from sliding friction. boxes back there. That was it. We went really far. Total fun. Let's try something else. So what are we going to do next? Now we're going to do the frictionless this thing that we have at Science Max Headquarters, a hover disc. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Where did you get it? Built it. Season one. Amazing. As you may remember from that episode, a hover disc uses air to greatly reduce the friction with the ground. Here we go. 
So what would a hover disc do on a ramp? Right. Only one way to find out. Let's recap. Friction is when two surfaces rub against each other. You can have a very small amount of friction or a very large amount, depending on the materials. And using science to reduce friction results in the best sledding experiences. Nicely done. Science, Max. Experiments at large. Your turn? My turn? Yeah, let's okay, do it. Okay, so take those and I'll get this yep. and then I'll give you the helmet. And then we gotta rebuild the... Rebuilding the boxes is like the hardest part yeah. of this whole situation. But... No. I should, I should. Everything's fine. And then this one, and then that one, and then that one, and there you go. Aha, giant climbing frog! Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Today, it's all about opposites. Things that float, and things that uh, don't. Water, and gravity. Gravity? What goes up doesn't have to come down. Unless it's built, you know, poorly. All on this episode of Science Max, Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil. And I am Opposite Phil. Opposite Phil. That's right. Blue lab coat, yellow shirt, evil mustache. I see. Anyway, we're looking at opposing forces today. That's uh, forces that make things go down and forces that make things go up. Right. Things with more density and things with less density. Uh, gravity and the opposite, which is anti-gravity. Anti-gravity isn't really a thing. You're... Well, I have to do the opposite. Right. Um, buoyancy. And buoyancy's opposite. Which is girlancy! No, girlancy is not the opposite of buoyancy. You know, you're not helping. Right! Not helping! Opposite! Ha <laughs> ha! Hello! Uh, 